I'm Dr. Lewis Hoffman of Saybrook University. This brief lecture is on understanding the psychological dimensions of poetry. It's being developed as part of a series of lectures that are being designed in connection with a poetry, healing, and growth class that I teach at Saybrook University. The first lecture that focuses on the psychological dimensions of poetry is really focusing just on an aspect of the psychological dimensions as related to writing poetry, reading poetry, listening to poetry, and understanding poetry. In the next, seri next several lectures, it's going to further unpack the psychological aspects of poetry. The second lecture is going to focus on poetry and intrapersonal processes, particularly awareness, and the third lecture on poetry and interpersonal processes, particularly focusing on meaning and the creation of meaning. The next two lectures are going to focus on poetry and interpersonal processes, the first focusing on empathy and the second on deepening relationship and promoting healing uh, in interpersonal settings. The last lecture then is going to po focus on poetry and, and uh, broader aspects, poetry and society, using poetry for activism, social change, broader understanding, things of this nature. So particularly interesting quote by Charles Darwin. If I had to if I had my life to live over again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week. Personally, I try to cultivate a habit of reading a poetry a poem at least once a day. Often I try to begin and end the day with poetry just in order to uh, keep in that spirit, keep in that connection with poetry, and I find when I do that, it helps me thinking more and along the lines of poetry, and poems will emerge more, and I'll, I'll also find myself attending to myself better and in different ways, uh, approaching other things more creatively. So it, it has a lot of benefits beyond just uh, trying to, to write and, and understand poetry. When we think about uh, poetry and history, poetry has been around and has emerged in many different cultures, and emerged in them, it appears independently in many different cultures. And it can be seen that poetry is an ancient healing tradition that really has applications across many cultures. Before we had psychotherapy, we had poetry, and poetry served many of the, the same purposes that, that psychotherapy does. So poetry has had many roles across time. It's had an important role in telling one's personal or collective story, and we, we see this in, in history quite clearly. A poetry is often used in coping, and it may be in coping through telling one's personal or collective story. It plays a role in creating meaning. It plays a role in creating connection or bringing groups together, building cohesion in groups. It plays a role in entertainment. It plays a role in persuasion and trying to, to persuade people to see things differently. And there's many, many other roles that poetry has played across time. And when we think of the context of poetry, we can think of various different uh, levels and, and contexts for poetry. We can think of the scholarly level, people who are, are trying to be uh, professional poets and scholars of poetry. Now, this is one level of writing poetry that I'm guessing most people that watch this are not aspiring to. That people who are able to make a living off of poetry as either in the scholarly form or in the more popular or entertainment form is a, is a small percentage of people. And I know some that uh, have a strong opinion that if you're not writing to poetry to, to seek these levels, then it's a, it's a waste of time and uh, even have heard people say it's offense to people that uh, that have cultivated the craft of poetry to to try and write on a, a lay level. Well, I think all the different levels are, are valid, and I would say that all of them are vital. That the scholarly level certainly is going to be written and subjected to a different level of scrutiny, and it should be. Uh, and the popular poetry that is written for poetry books to be consumed and in mass volumes for people to try and make a living off of poetry, again, there's going to be a, a certain level of, of critique that needs to be a part of that, uh, and even some degree for entertainment. But when we think of poetry as a healing art that belongs to everyone, we all should be able to write and, and share and enjoy poetry that's written uh, 
in different forms. So I encourage people, you do not have to have a, to, call, to write poems at the level of them being published or accepted to journals or, or, so, or collections of poems that could be accepted as books to write poetry. Write where you're at and seek to get better with your own standards and with your own goals for what you're writing. But all the different forms are, are highly valid. And we can think of the different styles in the of poetry, and there are many styles, and there's no one right way. A lot of people, when starting to write poetry, they get stuck on the idea, well, it's got to it's got to rhyme, otherwise, it's not a good poem. Well, rhyming poems is one form of poem. It's a it's a beautiful form of poem. Quite often, it's a difficult form of poem to to perfect, uh, and it definitely has its place. But it's not the style of poems that many people want to be writing. Uh, particularly as getting started, and it, it may be something to play around with as you go on. But poems do not necessarily have to rhyme. Some poems are, are structured, contained, short, uh, having a certain number of lines per stanza, etc. And this is fine, but it's again, it's not all poems. There's free verse poems that, that don't really follow a lot of the rules. There's sonnets, haikus, landes, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that last one right there, that are particular forms of poems that, that are, once again, they're beautiful, but they're not the right form for everyone. There's prose poetry, which some would say is, is not really poetry, but just prose writing with a poetic feel to it, uh, regardless of, of how we want to classify it. Prose poetry is another form of creative writing that can be quite beautiful. Poetry can be descriptive, it can be expressive, it can be symbolic. Uh, it doesn't need to be all of these. Sometimes people try to combine all of these into a poem. There can be different ways of breaking, different ways of indenting, different ways of punctuating. All of these are, are creative ways to bring something to the poem. And uh, I'd encourage you, if you're just starting, to, to play around with them. Even if you've been writing for a while and you're stuck in a particular form, Play around with it for a while. Try out something different. It may help free up your, your poetic voice. Uh, and you may find that you're able to write something uh, different than you've ever written before that, that you like. So play with the different styles. And the different styles can have different meanings and impact. That uh, there, There's historical aspects of it. The land is of uh, Afghanistan, for example. There, uh, it's been a beautiful book written about the, the role that these play in culture. And it can be a way of passing on wisdom and passing on stories and 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 sharing things that are they're quite powerful. These are very very short poems, like haiku is very short poems, and they they serve a particular purpose in certain ways. Uh, when using poetry in therapy, sometimes people will use a very structured or contained form of poetry in order to kind of symbolize and work with containing emotions, whereas at other times there may be more emphasis put on just free verse and writing more openly and, and opening things up. So sometimes, whether it's structured or more loose, can play a role in either containing or opening up. That, that's not going to ring true for everyone. Uh, for some people, the, the style doesn't really matter. It might still open up or, or contain. But they can have different impacts on people. So again, it can be good to play around with the different styles and forms. If you have the words, there's always a chance that you'll find the way. Let's talk a little bit about writing poetry. Often getting started is the biggest challenge. Uh, I've talked to many people that say, I don't write poetry, or I haven't written poetry in a long time, that will say, I can't write poetry, that, uh, you know, it, it, often it comes back to some of these rules that they place on, like, I can't rhyme, I'm not good at rhyming, I don't have good rhythm. Um, I don't understand poetry. All these different things can be used. Uh, and so there's often these psychological barriers to work through in, in writing poetry. And so just getting started often is important. And then getting started in an environment that's going to help nurture and accept the poems and allow for them to grow. So it, it, uh, it takes some time at time to work past some of, of these blocks that people may have, just like blocks that are often common in different forms of writing, but pushing yourself to, to get started a lot of times can start to open up to, to really exploring it. Poetry is often an emotional craft as much as an intellectual craft. And so it can help to set the tone. Uh, 
when uh, I'm being intentional about wanting to write poetry, I'll often uh, put on a particular type of music that is uh, going to uh, inspire me to the type of poem that I'm seeking to write. And it may be different types of music at different times. And the setting is often important. At times I'll go to nature to write. At times I'll go to public settings and, and I'll engage in people watching in order to, to try and come up with a poem. And, and sometimes in doing that I'll I'll imagine a story of, of someone that I see and I'll, I'll write a poem in what I imagine to be their voice. It may not ring true to their experience at all, but it's a way of, again, it's a way of being creative and trying to, to free oneself up. So setting that tone, setting the, the context is important, and that's going to be different uh, for different people. And then also there's that non-judgmental attitude that I'm going to keep ho hovering back to this in different ways because it's, it's critical. There's a place for the critique of poems, and there's a place for the refinement, even when you're writing for fun. Um, and not seeking for publication or anything like that. There's a place for refinement and such. But when you're writing it, that's often not the place. Typically, that's not the place, especially when you're getting started. That non-judgmental attitude is really key. Uh, if you're struggling, one thing that can be helpful is uh, to imitate types of poetry. So you may find a, a couple of different styles of poems and try to imitate it putting it into your own words, your own voice. It may be a close Im imitation, and then over time, a little bit more of a loose imitation. But it's a way to uh, to try and, and start off to exploring different forms, different styles, or, or just getting into writing in, in general. And as you try, again, try out the different forms. What you write may different than what, be different than what you like. So you may be drawn to haikus, but you just can't write them very well. They don't seem to fit with, with yours. And maybe that'll come down the, the line. Maybe you just need to, to work on it and keep practicing at it. But maybe what you write will be different than some of the styles that you uh, most enjoy. So play out with the different ways. Try handwriting versus typing. That uh, Sometimes you'll find that you get different impacts. Some people, they, they just can't type poems. They have to handwrite them. And they can maybe come back and type them later. Uh, for others, the typing is important because it helps them keep up with their thoughts. So there can be a variety of different reasons, but, but try both, both ways. You can even try doing them out loud and recording them and writing them down later. The audience, an, or an imagined audience, can be a part of writing poetry at times. Sometimes that may be just yourself, just one person, a group. And it may be that you have an imagined audience that you're not really going to share it with, and that is fine. But ha sometimes just having the audience, having the idea of where the poem's going to going to go, even if you know deep down inside that it's not going anywhere, but having that imagined audience for some people really helps to be able to write. It helps to, to fashion the, the poems. And then thinking about what is the impact of purpose. And it may just be, I'm writing this for myself. I'm writing to express. I'm writing to get out. For others, I'm writing because I want people to know and understand. Giving some consideration to that can help. But again, at times you want to just let all that go and just write whatever comes. At times you may be more intentional and at other times less intentional. That can be very helpful to try out the different approaches that way as well. A poem begins as a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong a homesickness, a lovesickness. So as you're getting ready to, to write poetry and trying to get started, read poems out loud. Listen to poems being read and listen to music. These can be nice ways of getting oneself into the spirit of writing. I often will find myself, I might spend half an hour reading poems or sometimes just reading over one poem for for a while, and as I do this, one starts to form, and then I'm able to go write my own poem. So often engaging them in these different ways. For some people, reading helps. For some people, listening to poems helps. For some people, music. For some people, all three in different times. Journaling. Now, when I first got back into to writing poetry after uh, probably about a 10-year break, I found that most of my poems would start off when I was just journaling. And then I would notice a poetic feel at some part, point start to emerge in the journaling. And so I would then shift to starting to put it into a poem. And sometimes it would just be a section. And I'd go back to journaling and then another section. 
And so we'll, we'll just follow what, what emerged there. So journaling can, can really help. And it can help quite often to write when, when ready. So be ready when, when you're listening when you're, uh, to music, when you're going for a walk, be ready to write. This leads to kind of the idea of pre balancing pressure and patience. I think it's good if you're really trying to be serious about writing poetry, even if it's just for yourself, to try and write every day. It might be two lines someday. It might be four lines. It might be two minutes someday. It might be half an hour, an hour someday. But days. But try to write every day. Try to get something down. It doesn't have to be good. Just try and cultivate the habit. But when writing, be patient. Don't force it. Let it come. Uh, so you might at times pressure yourself just to get those two lines down to keep up the habit, but you need to have that place for patience as well, that time when you can write and just let it emerge. So I've said a number of things that point to this idea of catching that moment, right when you feel it. So it's often good to keep scratch paper or something to write with. I used to regularly walk around with, uh, and still do sometimes, with this uh, notebook. It's a, it's a nice leather-bound notebook that I can take with me when I go hiking or, or walking, wherever I may go. I can just easily carry it with me. And then would have a pen with it so I could just sit and write. And would write a lot of poems as I was on hikes, as I was walking through town. I would just find a bench or a place on the ground and write. So having something with you to write is, is, is helpful. Now I, I do it in a variety of ways. Sometimes I take that journal, but I also, um, on my iPad and, and iPhone, I have a, a program. Uh, the one I use is called Evernote. There's a lot of different forms that will synchronize across the different uh, forms. And so I can just write a poem on there. I pretty much always have my phone with me, so sometimes I, I write it on there. I, I generally struggle more with, with uh, writing on my phone, but um, on my iPad, I can write much more freely. I have a keyboard with it and can just write freely. So I take these with me when I'm, I'm wanting to write. I'll have a notebook or the iPad ready to go so that when I feel inspired, I can put something down. That can be quite helpful to, to, to catch it at the moment. Editing then can become an important part of, of poems. But I think it's good to separate the writing and the editing, particularly with poems, that I have more times than I'd like to admit had this idea of a poem and it was forming and I had a good portion of it uh, formed in my mind and then I sat down to start and get it, to get it on paper. And for me, a lot of times, I have to have a, a pretty good section of it formed in my mind to, in order to be able to write. At times, I also will have just one or two lines that I've written and, and it's not complete and I sim let those simmer for a while. I've had a couple of those that have simmered literally for years and I keep coming back to these lines and then all of a sudden the poem comes and uh, it just found its way. But I, I generally have to have, you know, a, you know, four, six, eight, sometimes more lines starting to form in my mind and then I can sit down and, and write the poem. But at more times than I'd like to admit, I've started to do that and I got two lines down and then I started fiddling with editing that. It didn't feel quite right. And I lost the rest of the poem. It just slipped away from my mind. And so keeping that writing and editing separate, I think, can be quite helpful for a lot of people. I've kind of learned over the time, and most of the time I can follow this now, that when I, when I have those lines, I get them down, try to keep going uh, with it to finish it, or maybe that's the whole poem. And then once I feel like I've got a draft, I'll come back and edit it. Sometimes it might only be half a poem, and I'll come back and edit it. And by working through and editing it, there comes the next half of the poem. So editing is an important process a lot of times. Uh, often it's good to keep the different versions. When doing this in a healing and growth process, I, I find it's particularly powerful that I've done this as a therapist working with clients, having the... Or having them keep, or sometimes I've kept different versions of a poem over time, and it can be a way of tracking, uh, dealing with a particular issue, kind of tracking their progress in therapy almost. So that can be uh, something that's that can be quite useful at times uh, to to save the different versions and look back at them over time. But often 
uh, I found that I've written a poem and I've changed it to a different direction later on, but then decided, you know, maybe that first version was better. Unfortunately, at times I, I deleted it, and so now I, when I make a big change like that, I generally keep the different versions. Often, uh, uh, the, when writing, I'll find that certain things come in kind of a cliche form or in uh, words that, that aren't rich enough. But the rest of the poem maybe is a little bit better, but sections of it aren't. So I get that down with the emotional feel, and then when I come back, that's when I address that. So if too many cliches, and, and I try to avoid cliches unless there's a particular reason to include it, but if too many cliches are emerging in a poem, when I'm first writing it in that moment, that's okay. I let them stay for that time, and then when I come back, I will edit that out. There's certain words that I find I use too frequently, and often my first versions of poems are just too wordy. And so coming back and editing, often what I'll find is the lines become shorter. They become more concise. I edit out some words. I edit out some cliches. But I first start with that draft, and then the editing uh, is able to strengthen the poem. Sometimes the poem, and increasingly as I write more, and when I'm in a good groove about writing regularly, there's not as much to edit. But uh, particularly when starting, a lot of times, there's that process, and by knowing that you're going to come back to it, sometimes you can give your permission, self-permission to write in the moment. And then it's important to always be able to accept when it's good enough. Uh, this is difficult for me in, in some ways, but I've worked a compromise for myself. Uh, I consider myself a tinkerer of poems, so uh, I will often, when I've got a few minutes, since uh, I keep all of my poems in, in Evernote, so I can access them anywhere I have... Uh, my computer or iPad or, or phone, I'll often, when I'm sitting in line in a doctor's office, I'll just be going through some of my poems, and I might tinker with them a little bit, changing a word or two here or there. And uh, so I'm constantly editing them. But also I've learned to accept of when a poem is good enough that I feel comfortable sharing it, um, or feel comfortable where it's at for whatever purpose it's, it's serving. So you can accept that it's good enough and keep tinkering with it. So I, I often, when I share poems, find myself feeling compelled to say, this is this is a draft, uh, because I never feel like the poems are, are ever completely done, but uh, they can be good enough at times. It's important to remember that not every poem will be a gem. If you're trying to, to, to make every poem a great poem, uh, you probably are going to have trouble writing great poems that be allowing yourself to write bad poetry often helps you write good poetry. So not every poem is going to be perfect. Um, it's important to recognize that sometimes the, the, the power, what really makes a poem is going to be just in a, in a short uh, portion of it. And so you might find that one good line or one good stanza can really make a poem and the rest might be a little more bland. Maybe over time you can rework that to uh, improve it, but I think often you have these few great lines, and many of my favorite poems that, of others that I've uh, read, I'll find, you know, much of the poem's okay, but then there's these couple of lines that, that are just great and really make it stand out. And uh, so sometimes a few good lines can really make a poem. When writing, you can think of different ways of going about it. You can think about description, and this can be a, a physical description of what you see out there or, or what you feel in here. So it can be describing something. There's a lot of great nature poetry, you know, describing uh, something. And sometimes this is just about seeing the beauty in the world, and sometimes it's a metaphor for something else. Uh, either way is fine, but often just starting with that description. Um, and sometimes it can be inner. And you may find that, uh, you know, if you're, you're stuck in a rut with, with writing, you may find sometimes you can just go and try and describe something. So right now, I'm, as I'm sitting here giving this lecture, I'm looking out the window. And I, I see that there's a, you know, the, the window shades there and um, a very light pink colored shade over the window. And the windows are open and outside I see the, the trees flowing. Behind that, see some of the neighbors' houses and occasionally see a bird going by. So maybe 
to get started, you can just write and describe that in as vivid of language as you as you can. And maybe over time, as you're writing it, as you're thinking about it, as you're meditating on it, it can become a metaphor for something more. But sometimes just starting with that description. Maybe the description is all you're seeking, but sometimes starting with description can lead to something more. If you're struggling with something emotionally, this can be particularly true. Then maybe you don't quite understand what you're experiencing emotionally and what you're experiencing within your body. And so that description may help you to, to understand it. This is something very simpler, similar to what's done in psychotherapy often, is by describing uh, in, in uh, detail what you're experiencing, you begin to understand it better. Uh, images, metaphors, and symbols. These are very important in poetry. And the images a lot of times can be that, that, that description, but they can be more than that too. And the metaphors and symbols, symbols as well. Uh, this is something, again, a lot of people struggle at when they're first starting to write poetry, is how do I, how do, I do symbols? Well, you might start by, by being intentional about it when you're trying to in integrate these. And this might be something you don't do until you're a little more comfortable and in the groove writing if you're just getting started with poetry. But then you might try and come up with a metaphor and symbol and just try several different poems to unpack it and play around with it. So you may be intentional with it at first. Again, kind of forcing it to get started, but then allow it to come. Start with a, a basic symbol, basic image, a basic metaphor, and allow it to gradually unfold. So you see the paradoxes of pushing oneself and allowing. I think that's an important balance in, in writing poetry. Poetry is what happens when nothing else can. So about poems. I really like to, to think of poems as they're not something that are just our own. Our poems are not something just for ourselves. They're something that, that go beyond ourselves. They're a product of, of our own experience and our context, our culture, our family, things that are happening around us, all influence. They're a product of symbols that we see and consume, images we see and consume. And poems emerge at least partially from our unconscious. So we may never fully know the meaning of our poems. And I'll talk about this more in one of the coming lectures as well. But we may never fully know the meaning of our poems. I think of poems much like dreams, that the dreams may have multiple meanings, that uh, may continue to uh, unpack them and unpack them and find different meanings, different possibilities about them. And we may never fully know what a dream means. The same can be true often with poems. So I think it's best to set poems free, whether they're ours or someone else's. Let them be interpreted by others as they will. Um, you can share your interpretation. And, uh, you know, I'll often uh, share with people um, what was going on with me when I wrote a poem. But I also want them to be able to, to take it where they need to take it. Uh, I've seen this particularly with uh, one poem, which was one of the, the early poems that I, I wrote and started sharing after I returned to poetry. And it was about, um, it was written in a, a client's voice of, about her, her mother's impending death. And as I originally wrote this poem, I shared it with uh, a colleague who had been a supervisor of mine previously, and uh, he, at the time his wife was very sick, and so it, it took on a very different meaning to him. And over time for myself, as, as my mother went through a period of being sick, the poem took on a different meaning to me as well. Um, so the poem, even my meaning of it changed over time. And I think this is one of the beautiful things about poetry, when we can allow this to happen. It doesn't mean that we have to let go of that original meaning. It means that we're allowing for a poem to have more than one meaning, for oneself and for others. And that's okay for it to have more than one meaning. That I, you know, I think some of the really great artists are, are quite good at this, that sometimes they're, they're resistant to interpreting their own work, because uh, when they interpret their own work, then often... Others don't want to interpret it. They don't want to bring what it means to them. 
but there's times that I found a song that, you know, I, I had a sense of what the artist was writing this about originally, because maybe I heard something about it, but I, I found drawn to meaning something else for me, and I've struggled with that. But over time, what I, I've come to accept is that's okay. I can take my own meaning to it. It doesn't, what I take from with that song or with a poem doesn't have to be the original intention of it. It can have more value to more people and more value to oneself if we allow multiple meanings to come about with a poem. And so I often really enjoy it when other people uh, hear or read a poem of mine and they bring a different meaning to it that I never thought of. Often I can recognize, well, I, I know that wasn't where I was going at the beginning, but but I can I can see the value in it and maybe it changes what the poem will mean to me over time. Don't use the phone. People are never ready to answer it. Use poetry. So reading and hearing poetry. It's often good to read or listen to a poem more than once. Pause afterwards, meditate on it a little bit. Um, poems often may not make sense in the first reading. That uh, I've started to cultivate a practice that a lot of poems that, that I'm drawn to, I'll uh, use the same Evernote program and I'll type them up and I'll put them in a different folder on them. And frequently I'll find that some of the poems that I put in there, I don't know that I understand. But putting them on there, I can come back to them easily again when sitting in a line or um, when I've just got a few moments and I can come back through this poem and over time it'll start to make sense. At times only a few lines of it make sense, but that draws me in so that I want to understand the full poem. And so I'll keep coming back to it over time. But because of the nature of poems, because they use personal symbols quite often, they draw upon particular things in the context that the reader may not be aware of. There can be some challenges to understanding uh, poems. And so if it doesn't make sense at first, but you find yourself drawn to it, often I find that there's a reason for that. Maybe your unconscious is picking up on something that your conscious isn't yet. But stick with it. Um, and if you find just a couple lines in a poem that you like, come back to it. See if uh, if over time you may get a deeper meaning or a broader meaning or a new appreciation for the rest of the poem. It can be good to read a poem out loud and silent. So if you're just reading it to yourself, sometimes try reading it out loud. I, I don't do this as often as I, I would like to, um, but I, I do find at times when I have a poem and I'm going through it and I'm drawn to it, or I like it, or I'm trying to understand it. Sometimes when I read it out loud, I'll get a different sense of it. So this can be helpful. Pay close attention to the punctuation and breaks. You know, and these are some of the, the really powerful things that uh, with poetry that I, you know, I think of a comma or a line break. It can be just like a pause in therapy, that allowing that right pause in therapy, that right pause in a conversation can allow for a different meaning, can allow for a deeper reflection. It can be quite powerful. So pay attention to the punctuations, the breaks, the form. All of these are often adding something to the poem. Discuss the meanings with others. Often, again, you know, you, you may bring different things. And once again, this is another one of those themes I like to just continuously come back to. Don't hold on tightly to a meaning unless it's a meaning you need. Now, sometimes you might find you read a poem and it just speaks to you, and you got to hold on to that. But you can still look for other meanings as well. Uh, it's the same thing with dreams. That uh, you know, when I um, record my dreams and try and figure out what it may mean, I always try to, to keep in mind that just because I find a meaning that, that seems to click with me, that doesn't mean it's the only meaning or the, the deepest meaning or the right meaning let it continue to unfold is, is quite helpful. Well, when listening to to uh, poetry, again, it's often good to have the two readings of it. When I read poems to groups, I often will give two reads to it. And frequently, uh, I'll give a certain instruction and say, now the first time that I read this, try to not pay attention to the words. That's hard to do. Most people, 
are going to do that at least to some degree just automatically, but it can be helpful. It works much better uh, when I've read poems in, in China where the poems are translated and a lot of people don't understand uh, the poem, but I find that they often, when they can't understand the words, they will pick up on a lot of the feel and the tone, and then when it's read with translation, they get a different appreciation for it. So often listen to it, listen to the, the sound, the feel of the poem, and don't attend to the words, then the next time listen for the words. Listen to your own different, listen to different readings in your own. Uh, when you hear someone else read a poem, then read it yourself. See if it's different. Look for the different subtle meanings in what you hear, the different subtle emotions in what you, that, that come out. Uh, I, I tend to be someone when I read poem, I, I, poems uh, in, including my own and others, I will feel something deeply. And I'll hear it being expressed through my voice in, in subtle ways. And it's interesting when doing that because I'll find that there's some people that that don't hear that, and there's some people that do. Poetry often will be able to express feelings in this very subtle way. And it's one of the beauties of poetry. It's one of the reasons why I think poetry can really help for us to, to better understand emotions and better, become more empathetic and more compassionate and understanding of others. It's because things can be packaged in these subtle emotions at times, whether read or, or through the words, and being able to recognize those can be quite powerful. Then let's talk a little bit about uh, the impact. I mentioned before, sometimes we can be impacted even without understanding. When this happens, stick with that poem, stick with that song, so whatever type of art it is. If you have that happen, stick with it. I find that often there's a meaning at the unconscious level that has been connected with, but it's not been able to make its way to the consciousness yet. In groups, some of this have already pointed towards already. When listening and reading poetry in groups, I often will try many different ways of going about it, that, such as before listening to just the feel and then the words, having different people read the poem, having someone who's never read it before read it, and then someone who's familiar with it read it. Using these different readings can really open up different things. And so I, I find this to be very helpful um, if you're using poetry in, in group settings. Never presume, presume a meaning, your own or others, to be definitely true. This is at least the third, maybe fourth time I've come back to that. But when we're in groups, that's important. And I think it's important when working with poems in group to be explicit about that most of the time, to tell people that so that um, they're willing to put forth. And I, that can free some people up to speak. That sometimes if uh, a person who's not as immersed in poetry or who it's new to is, is listening to a poem or, or maybe just a little insecure uh, in the expressing themselves about poetry, if someone else gives a, a good interpretation, they may feel, well, that's right, I can't offer my own. But when we're explicit about setting this, about what does it speak to for you, that can be quite uh, helpful in opening up the different meanings. Um, don't force your meaning, honor the different meanings that arise. To be a poet is a condition, not a profession. I think this by Robert Frost is particularly true when we uh, think of living in the context of poetry and what poetry can do. And I I don't read Robert Frost as talking about being a professional poet, someone that writes good enough, popular enough poetry that they can make a living off of it. But I think this can speak just as just as true to lay poets that maybe will never write a poem that's ever going to be published, but it becomes a, a way of being. Um, you know, I, I will often use an example of Tom Greening with this. That uh, Tom Greening is a, a psychologist that writes a lot of poetry and. Uh, sometimes I've teased him that I, I think he thinks in poetry. That uh, I remember one time uh, someone had 
mentioned a comment that no one has, I don't think anyone's ever written a poet about a particular topic. I can't remember what the topic was, but uh, so I, I commented, the person said, well, before you say that, you better ask Tom Greening because he's written poems about some, quite a few different topics. And so person emailed Tom and pretty soon I get this email from Tom uh, with a, a poem about whatever this topic was and I, I responded to him. And Tom responds with a, with a poem and I responded again and Tom responds with another poem. And this went on some time. And, uh, and then pretty soon Tom responds with a poem but before he says, geez, you're like an enabler to an addict and then put another poem down. But I've seen this often where you know, I'll send Tom an email and he replies with a poem or I've seen him sit in, in lectures and instead of taking notes, he writes a poem. And it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a way that Tom seems to see and experience the world. And it's, it's very unique. I think a lot of professional poets uh, don't spend as much time cultivating the, the art of poetry as what, what Tom does. And, you know, he writes a few different styles of poem. And they may appeal to some and they may not appeal to some. But it's not about uh, Tom's poetry so much as just the way of relating to poetry that Tom is connected with. That he's really embraced it as a deep part of who he is. And it's a, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing to see, uh, to watch uh, how Tom relates to poetry in this way. Uh, so I, I do think... Poetry, part of why it's so important is because it does impact who we are. It can change the way that we experience ourselves in the world. I find that I see and experience the world much differently when I'm regularly reading poetry and writing poetry, that it's quite powerful. Um, recently, I was working on developing a course on a poetry and poetry, death, loss, and life transitions. And, and going through, through that, reading lots of poetry, about death and loss, boy, I could really start to to see how it was impacting me in many different ways. Um, it's powerful stuff, and you know, sometimes immersing ourselves in a particular type of poetry will will really be helpful like that. Sometimes it it may become overwhelming after a while. I needed to take a break from that that genre of poetry and started to space out the the death poetry through some other. Uh, types of poetry, including some that were intentionally very positive forms of poetry. But as we read poetry regularly, write poetry regularly, try spending a month or two months just reading and writing poetry every day. See if you see the world, experience the world differently. I would bet for most of you, you do. Some maybe not, but for most of you, I probably you probably will. And I think this, to me, is part of what I hear in this quote uh, by by Robert Frost, that uh, that it's about... It's, it's about a condition. Being a poet is a condition, um, not a profession. All right. Well, hopefully that uh, you, you enjoyed this brief lecture and that it was beneficial to you in, in thinking through a little bit about some of the psychological aspects of writing, reading, and listening to poetry.